Good read. Visit a different world with Richard and Judy. Exclusive to WH Smith. I do enjoy lazing in the pool in this glorious weather. It's positively tropical here. Cornish cocktail, darling. Same again, please. Yeah, one summertime special coming up. Oh, hang on. That's going to have to wait, actually. We need to get cracking on the latest download. Come on, get off that lilo. All right. I'll slip into something less comfortable. A good summary to me is something that is light-hearted and makes me feel all yummy inside when I've read it. And then I think um, also when I think I must read, if I've read a certain author, I want to read the, another book that she's written. The, you know, it just leaves you, you know, feeling good. The book I was reading before Gone Girl was Beach Huts by Veronica Henry. And that's just a great book. Uh, you can pick it up, put it down, and it's all the stories from all the different beach huts and they all get their answers at the end um, and it just gives you a warm glow and it's just a, a lovely, lovely read and um, yeah, it's not very taxing or anything like that but sometimes you don't want that, sometimes you just want to pick up a book and be on a beach and, and just follow all these different people's stories. For me, my favourite summer read is the kind of book you can take on holiday with you and you know you're going to be in safe hands. There's nothing worse than wasting a holiday on something that's either over-challenging or at the same time under-challenging. From the Richard and Judy list, my favourite holiday book was certainly, and still remains, Gone Girl. And I think the reason for that is that it's a book you just can't put down. And the frustrations of having a book like that when you're working every day is that you have to keep stopping. Hello, I'm Vanessa LaFay and my book is called Summertime. It's great. I mean, sometimes the hurricane season is, is very kind to the Florida Keys. It has been in recent years, actually. And nature's whirling dervishes pass the chain of islands by. At other times, the full force of extreme weather is unleashed on these defenceless, extremely low-lying communities. And summertime is set in one of those terrible years. It actually happened in this year, 1935, the biggest hurricane ever to come ashore in America since then. There hasn't been one as big since then. And the simmering racial tensions in the Florida Keys explode in a kind of dreadful symmetry with this approaching storm. It is absolutely gripping. The atmosphere in the book, you, you could cut with a knife, and Vanessa's here now. You had the inspiration for the story in terms of the, of the racial tensions between the black and the white communities um, because of some research you were doing into a book of a completely different nature, and you came across a terrible account of a, a lynching, um, a white lynching of a black man. Just tell us about that, because it, it devastated you when you read it. Yes, I hadn't written anything for a while and probably th and thought I probably wouldn't write anymore because I hadn't had success with my previous books. And I was on a visit to my family in Florida when I opened the morning paper and read a big feature about what was called a spectacle lynching. It took place in a place called Greenwood, Florida in 1935, the same year in which my book is set. Yeah. And uh, no one's ever been prosecuted for the, for the murder of a man called Claude Neal. And I read this feature with growing horror, but also outrage. And by the end of it, I felt so... Um, Can I just interrupt? A spectacle lynching. It's like party time. Be people, people were invited. People were invited to people it, right. Across the state were invited. Authorities knew about it, but did nothing to, to stop it. Journalists knew knew about it, and it it, it was at a at a time when these when these things were part of life. And mm. once I got to know a bit more about this time, I found out that Florida was the lynching capital of the South in 1935. Are we talking Ku Klux Klan here? Were, I mean, did they wear the kind of uh, the hoods and the? These were ordinary people. Ordinary people. These were ordinary people. The, the clan was in power at the time, yes. Right. But they weren't but, wearing masks. They had no fear of prosecution or identification. They didn't care. No, but. that's right. And and yes, yes, people were invited across the state to come. And, and there were telegrams going up to the federal government saying someone must stop this. And there wasn't the will. There wasn't the interest mm. in stopping it. 
So he was murdered, and this newspaper story was all about the fact that everyone knew who did it. The, the, the families of the people who did it were still alive. This was 75 years later. And they had succeeded in intimidating law enforcement and journalists, anybody who had tried to get to the bottom of it and um, bring any, anyone to justice. So I thought, this is a story that should be dramatized. Mm -hmm. And I thought, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try. I'd never written historical fiction. But through the miracle of the internet, once I started researching Florida in the 30s, I discovered the story of the veterans in the hurricane. And um, I, was, I was taken over by it. Now the veterans, these, these were work gangs basically. Uh, obviously we're in the depression here in 35, and these were work gangs. They were, they were basically heroes from the First World War. Uh, and these were mixed race work gangs, right? There were whites and, and blacks in these gangs. Yes, the majority were white. And they were basically given dirt poor jobs like building roads and bridges. Um, basically in lieu of the bonuses they were supposed to have received for fighting for their country. They never got them, so they've, they've been cheated out of that. So we find, so this book opens down on a sweltering summer Florida. The storm's approaching, it's only a few days away, and we have one of these work gangs embittered um, at each other's throats, as you say, because it's, it's, it's black and white, and they're in the lynching capital of the USA. I mean, what a cauldron, what a boiling cauldron to, to, to have invented. It's, it's, the atmosphere is, as I say, you could cut it with a knife, it's fantastic. Thank you. So tell us what happens, uh, obviously not the whole plot. Um, you have this work gang there, uh, and there's a, one particular black guy who's honourable uh, and intelligent and highly moral, and he's the guy who's going to be fingered for a rape a, on a white girl. For an attack, that's an right. An attack, yeah. Yes, that's right. Henry uh, comes from the town of, of Heron Key, but he's not been back for a very long time because uh, although he's one of the very few um, black officers to, to fight in the U.S. Army during World War One, he uh, has lost his way since the end of the war, as many of the veterans did, and has been uh, wandering in the wilderness for a long time before he's finally brought home to Heron Key by the chance of having this paid work on the, uh, the government uh, bridge building project, which brings him back into contact with the people from his past, yeah. his own family, and the girl, Missy, who idolized him as a, as a child. And she was a kid when he was a young officer, yeah. And no one has heard from him during the 18 years since the war has ended. And uh, the, the veterans pitch their camp outside. They're not, they're not popular um, amongst the locals for, for lots of reasons. And then when a white woman is, is attacked and beaten nearly to death, uh, the suspicion falls on Henry. Conveniently. Conveniently. Not only is he of the wrong color, but he's now seen as an outsider because he's, he's, he's with the veterans, even though he, he grew up in the town. And so uh, an investigation takes, takes place to try to find the, the identity of the attacker. Only the deputy sheriff in charge has his own issues with Henry and with race because of his own family. Um, and before anyone realizes what's happening, the hurricane you refer to, mm. which of course at the time they had no names, uh, is is building out in the Atlantic, and a series of a series of really unusual conditions have to be there all at the same time to produce a storm of, of, of this, this of this magnitude. Because we're talking about 200 mile an hour plus winds, aren't we? And that's what it was. I mean, it yes. was the, the biggest one ever recorded. Exactly. Yeah. And with a 20 foot high storm surge, so stronger than, Katr than Katrina, bigger than Superstorm Sandy, mm. on a place, as you say, which is below sea level at some places, yeah. but very, very low, low lying. It's extraordinary the history of hurricanes when you are on the Florida Keys, isn't it? I mean, you can go to uh, you can go to a hotel, say, on the Atlantic coast, and uh, in the in the middle of the hotel grounds, you will find a burial ground. Uh, you know, you will find a, a a white picket fence which encloses um, a fairly small area of, of memorial stones to the family who were there in a certain hurricane. And, and and there they and, and there they lie. And very often dead. they don't and lie there because they were never found. They were never found. Blown out to the other side. But that of the kind of that kind of if you like homage to uh, hurricanes, if you like, um, in Florida is there all the time, and everyone's complete fear um, and and acknowledgement that nature is an inescapable, unbeatable force. Mm. And I think that comes through beautifully in your book. 
get this incredible intersection of the of the drama of this incredible storm. We know how big it's going to be, and they don't as it's coming in. And at the same time, you've, without giving anything anything away, you've got the plot line of this this looming lynching of this good man happening at the same time. But of course, they're going to intersect, and the whole thing's going to be mixed up. It's brilliant. Yes, and and I was I was attracted to the idea of you have this very isolated, tiny community where everyone knows each other and everyone for generations past has been you know basically the same the same families living there and what happens when you bring a load of strangers in right. you know in every english village you can imagine it it, it, it mm -hmm. happening it's yeah. the same dynamic with with the us and them and the insiders and the outsiders because although the white locals have you know their own fears about black people in a way they fear the veterans more because they're not from they're not from there yeah, yeah. you know yeah just in terms of the, the tension between the white and the black community the, the book opens in a, in a wonderful irony with um, two black servants saving the life of a white baby who's it's a brilliant written opening it really grabs you literally by the jaws because an alligator tries to take the baby and drag it down into the creek and, and eat it but they manage to rescue it and it's a, it's a sensational opening and you get the irony straight away actually, <laughs> immediately well it's a it's the, one of the most powerful and enjoyable pieces of writing I can remember um, I shall read you the title again it's summertime and as I always point out at this juncture um, if you get this from WH Smith which of course is the the, uh, the, the shop that Judy and I do our our book club with, uh, you get exclusive content in the back. There's a Q&A between us and Vanessa that we did online, uh, which covers very different areas than the ones we covered here, um, and all sorts of other things, or author's inspirations, you name it. And it's all in the back, but only, only, only if you get it from W. H. Smith. So enjoy this one, uh, particularly if you're going to Florida this summer. <laughs> I've never had the luxury of long stretches of time to write because I've had two jobs and friends, family, life, etc. Et so I've only been able to write in, in short stretches of, of time, which has made it always seem like a luxury and something that I always look forward to doing. And I think that having to fit it into the rest of my life had, has made me more disciplined about it. It's also true that each time I come back to it, I see with more perspective what's good and what isn't. The best bit of advice for anybody who wants to write is to find a story that you care so, so passionately about that you'll do anything to get it out there because there are so many times when you will need that passion to keep you going. As a writer these days, I think it's so wonderful that it's easier than ever before to connect with your readers because with social media and the internet and things like that, it's possible to find out what people think, what they like, what they didn't like in a way that you just couldn't before. One of the things I love most is when people point stuff out to me that I didn't even realize myself when I was writing it. And when the characters become as real to them as they are to me, that's just a magical moment. And although some aspects of it can be scary, I just love the interaction with the people who've read my book. I read so much when I was younger. It was it was the thing I did I did I think for my for my whole childhood. I I think I had a book in my hand, but those books now have all just kind of have all just kind of run together, and um, the one that the one that stands out the most is probably one of lots of people's favorite childhood book, The Secret Garden. It's such a it's such a standard, it's such a classic, but but for good reason, and I and it's still probably the one I remember above all the others. Well, you know, tension doesn't get much tenser uh, in a book like this. It's fantastic. It's basically, we go back to 1935, to a real life, what they call it, the Labor Day hurricane. It was the biggest hurricane ever to make landfall, as they say, uh, on the American Eastern seaboard. There hasn't been one as big beforehand in recorded history or since, since 1935. It was a monster. Uh, and of course, in those days, they had very little way of forecasting where it was going to hit, when it was going to hit, and how big it was going to be. They didn't have satellite or anything like that. But it was, it was the all-time monster. And the book starts with the storm being on its way. 
It's in the Florida Keys, so it's a fictional key called Heron Key, and there's tension from the start. Basically, there's a, a work gang, ex-First World War soldiers, mostly white, some black, who are working on, on a government bridge project on Heron Key, and the local people don't like them being there. They think they're rough, they think they're dangerous. There's huge anti-black sentiment, both within the work camp and amongst the local whites against the blacks over there. So there's, there's a great melting pot of tension. And a white girl is viciously attacked as the storm comes in, and a very honorable, upright black laborer called Henry, former officer in the First World War, is conveniently fingered for the crime. And it looks like there's going to be a lynching. And that's, those are essentially the components of the story. It's about race, it's about weather, it's about hatred, it's about sex. I, I thought it was an extraordinary piece of work. It's, yeah, um, it's the kind of the absolute definition of sultry, isn't it, mm. in virtually every way. Um, I thought also, I mean, obviously the, the, the main story uh, with the hurricane in the background, the hurricane building, the main story is about uh, Henry and, and the racial tensions uh, and lynchings um, in the Deep South in those days. But also, I mean, I thought the way the kind of... Um, the class differences between the white citizens was very kind of carefully done. I mean, for example, the girl who's attacked, the woman who's attacked, her father is actually very rich, and they were a kind of they were they were a kind of very well-to-do local family. Yes, and she marries this awful ne'er do well who takes advantage of her weight, of her of her riches, and all the rest of it. And she's very unhappy in her marriage, and she becomes very fat. She puts she's been gorgeous. She puts on a lot of weight. She starts dressing very trashily, um, and so that you get all that kind of class warfare between the white Floridians as well as the racial warfare yes, between true. between the blacks and whites. I also, very good very good tale. I also love the, sh the, the sheriff character who, who, who it falls on his shoulders to investigate this, this terrible attack on this girl. Um, and he struck me as a little bit, in, in, in some ways, as the, the Rod Steiger figure in, heat, <laughs> in Heat of the Night, because actually, against all his instincts and southern instincts, he kind of feels driven to do the right thing. And, yeah. and, uh, and well, I won't say if he does or not, mm. but there are tensions there as well. It's a great story. Um, Very atmospheric. I mean, a really good story to read over the summer, especially if you're going to Florida. <laughs> no, I think it'll be the last, the last story hurricane. you want to read we go to Florida in the hurricane <laughs> season. I, I, I argue with you on that. Next time on the Richard and Judy Book Club. Claire McIntosh's I Let You Go. I found it just incredulous that out there was someone, that still now to this day, that there's somebody out there 14 years later who knows they've killed a child and other people who know what happened and nobody has come forward. It's a psychological thriller you will not be able to put down. Don't give anything away, no spoilers. Never, but it's an episode not to be missed. OK, that's enough. Right, I'm heading back to the pool to clock up some legs. Yeah, I, I'll be right there to join you, but I can't... Judy, I'm only where my armbands have gone. <laughs> <laughs>